Hey everybody, welcome to another Full Empire Promotions live event. I'm Dominic, as usual. I'll be your host for this Q&A with Kent McCord. We're live on Facebook via the Kent McCord Facebook fan group and Full Empire Promotions on Facebook, as well as YouTube, uh, Twitter, and now for the first time we're live on Instagram. Hopefully it's, it's going through. Uh, we cannot see any comments on Instagram, Unfortunately, they don't allow comments to pop up, but you can watch it through Instagram. So thanks so much to everyone who's joining us live. If you'd like to ask any questions, please feel free to leave those down below. And uh, if we have time, we'll bring them on screen and address them. Uh, make sure if you are on Facebook, that you go into facebook.com slash StreamYard and allow access uh, for your profile. Uh, if you don't do this, it's just going to come up. Your question is going to come up as Facebook user. It's not going to say your name. So if you want your name to be on screen, you'll have to go into this link and allow StreamYard um, to post your, your name. If you'd like to have your own conversation with Kent, he'll be doing chats one-on-one -on, -one on Zoom uh, tomorrow, January 27th, starting at 4 p.m. Eastern. You can chat with Kent uh, about whatever you'd like, and we'll even send you a recording of your meeting uh, as a downloadable link. In addition, you can get personally signed photographs from Kent as well as uh, video greetings over at fullempirepromotions.com. Sales for the Zoom uh, chats are going to end tomorrow around 3 p.m. Eastern. So if you'd like to book your session, we do have a few left. They are close to selling out, but there are a few open. So head on over uh, to fullempirepromotions.com for all information. Before I bring Ken on, I'm going to roll uh, a demo clip just to familiarize ourselves with some of his work. Didn't we meet a roll call? Yes, sir. You know, I can tell right off. Yes, sir. You've got a real flair for police work. Yes, sir. Reed, do me a favor. Yes, sir. See if you can manage to follow me to the car. As much as it's going to piss you off, you're going to have to play the game with this one. Effective immediately. Federal task force under the direction of Special Agent Peter Keyes will be investigating criminal activities involving the trafficking and distribution of controlled substances. Will extend him your full cooperation. Scott, how are you? Nathan. General Thomas is hemorrhaging up on the aircraft carrier. How'd you keep his Alpha Commandos off this mission? I said a welcome wagon with a gun doesn't make a very good first impression. <laughs> what if something out there is still alive? Well, then we're the luckiest sailors in history. What if they attack us? For a uniform, thanks alike. Oh, you were one. Yeah, for exploration, not for conquest. You like your parking place? Yeah, I don't know. Yours looks bigger. Don't forget it. Let's go to work. Expecting great things from you, Don. It's Don, right? Yeah, Don is fine. Dutch works too. Yeah, there's a lot of tradition that goes with his badge. Some of us would rather die than to see it abused or dishonored. Directly. 
Technically, Dunn was under over and I was under Dunn. Yep. So, Dunn, you were under over and over under. Yep. Uh, that's right. Dunn was over under and I was over Dunn. So, you see, both Dunn and I were under over, even though I was under Dunn. I couldn't turn you loose yet on the citizens of Los Angeles. No, sir. Not without a leash. No, sir. Let's head for the barn. You know him best as uh, Officer Jim Reed on Adam-12, as well as credits on Ozzie and Harriet, Predator 2, Galactica 1980, Return of the Living Dead 3, and newly the voice of Jacob Coe on the film on the uh, popular game Starfield. Let's welcome uh, the man of the hour, Kent McCord. Hey, Don, how you doing? Hey, Kent. Good to see you. Always nice to see that compilation that you put together. You did a great job with that. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it's probably a lot of that stuff probably felt like yesterday, right? Some of it, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I was I was scanning through some stuff the other night, and I remembered a, a show that I did called Private Eye, and uh, Michael Woods played the lead in it. Josh Brolin was his partner, and uh, you can kind of Google and find out where it is. And uh, you know, you, you through these years, you sometimes forget when you did a you know, an episodic here and there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you were in a role back then. I mean, you were going from one thing to another. So yeah. I'm sure some of the stuff's hard to remember, but it looks like you've got Australia there behind you. Yeah, that was, uh, that was Farscape. That was one of the, the best four years back and forth. Uh, you know, I, I, I told this story before I learned after the, about the second time going down there uh, and the way that, television especially works is they're handing you script pages constantly you may have a finished script and you read the script you learn what you're supposed to do and then they come in they hand you changes and i was just having a hell of a time remembering you know when they'd hand me that stuff uh, you know immediately before shooting it and then i read an article that said uh, one of the things that jet lag causes short-term memory so I insisted that they bring me down about three days before I had to begin to shoot because the general routine was go to the airport about 10 o'clock at night. You get on an airplane on a Monday night. You're there first thing Wednesday morning. You time you that day crossing the international date line. Yeah. And then, you know, if you're expected to go to work, it's fine if they don't, you know, they don't pull a fast one on you and give you a whole new set of pages that you have to learn immediately. You know, and so that became my pattern. And, uh, you know, and I'd go down there and do two or three episodes. And over that four year period, I think I wound up doing I don't know, a dozen or so episodes of, of uh, Farscape over that four year period playing yeah. Ben's dad. And the other thing about it was it was a fantastic cast of people, cast and crew. And, and some of the refugees, as I call them, from Sequest, uh, Rock O'Bannon created Farscape. David Kemper was a producer on Sequest and was the one who gave me the call uh, the night before I went down to play Ben's dad in the, in the first episode. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and Kemper is a friend to this day and a really, really good guy. And, mm -hmm. and we got together in New York uh, just before the pandemic in a, at a convention, the whole Farscape crew. And it was good to see all those people. It's it's difficult to look back and think. It's now been 25 years since we did that first episode. I went down in 1999 the first time. Wow. Wow. Time flies when you're having fun. Yeah. And sure. I had an apartment uh, that was just, if you go beyond uh, the back side of the opera house, I was looking at the back of the opera house. Not a not a bad uh, uh, no. quarters to be uh to stay in, you know, when you're away from home. No, not at all. Uh, Fred's joining us. You know, the the, the manager of the Kent hey, Fred. McCord. How you doing? Good, to, good to see your name, and uh, yeah, we'll catch up with him tomorrow. You yeah. know, when we're done the zooms. Cool. Uh, uh, so the first question we have is from Sue. She says, "Were you ever injured while filming Adam 12? Not, not really. N not anything that other than a scraped up knee and and. Uh, you know that that sort of thing. I I uh, I remember the two instances that really kind of 
put me in jeopardy. When I was chasing somebody, we were on the back lot. It was night, and I'm in a foot pursuit. And there came a step off of the off of the uh, off of the sidewalk at the curb down into the street. And I missed that bad step, and I went ass over tea kettle, and, you know, on that one. And then another one where we were searching for somebody. I think it was a a, a, a victim uh, of a, a serial killer thrown off the side of Mulholland down in a gully. And we shot this on the back lot, this portion of it. And we hear something, and I take off running down the hill, and there was a a uh, stabilizing piece of cable. They had a phony tree that they had this cable running from into the ground. And I hit that cable and again, did one of those things, yeah. but you know, they all, they, they, they didn't cause any permanent damage. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, we're waiting for more questions to come in. There are a few coming in, but let, let's talk about um, what you've been up to lately. Uh, re- well, re- let's, let's f- first get the thing out. Uh, I'm not a, a artificial intelligence uh, created object here uh, <laughs> as has been happening on uh, on uh, YouTube. I am not dead as has been happening on YouTube. Uh, you and I had this conversation. Somebody called for a, for an interview, Dominic, and I said, what's the upside of doing the interview? He said, you can tell people you're not dead. <laughs> so <laughs> there's about seven things on YouTube that are, are bemoaning my demise in in uh, you know while it seems well it really is stupid number one whoever puts that kind of stuff up but it's not kind of a uh, a victimless incident you know it hurt my wife's cousin who called in a panic uh another classmate of mine called that said thank god you've answered the phone i was going to a class reunion the 60th reunion of my high school class plus three years because of the pandemic. So, yeah. and, and, uh, and I, <laughs> a friend of mine who has been my lifelong friend has talked to him this morning. Yeah. Bobby called me and, and said, I just ran into uh, Marilyn and she said, Oh God, isn't it terrible? What happened to Ken? And Bob said, what happened? And she said, well, he died. And, <laughs> Bob said, really, I just talked to him a half hour ago. He's on his way here. <laughs> and this was at the reunion. So, you know, those kinds of things are out there. They're clickbait. And people actually, you know, as my wife's cousin did, who lives in Minnesota, you know, took uh, as something that had happened. You know, there was this cryptic uh, voicemail. Please call me. I've heard something terrible about Kent. So, you know, that stuff's out there. So I'm not dead. Uh, the other thing is we, uh, 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 there's a game uh, that that just came out in September, actually. I think six or seven that came out, it was posted, that I'd been working on for a couple of years uh, and had a uh, non-disclosure about it. So you can't say anything about it. And it came out and then, and then <laughs> quite, Interestingly, these people uh, who put this game out, and it's a big game called Starfield, you can look it up, uh, and uh, they gave somebody else my credit. <laughs> and and so I've been all over them about that since it, since it came out, trying to get it uh, rectified. But I am indeed Jacob Coe, the voice of Jacob, Jacob Coe on that game. There's that. And then after all of these years, and it's been a long, long time, since any of the episodes of Ozzy and Harriet have shown, uh, Ozzy had edited, there are 435 episodes of The Adventures of Ozzy and Harriet over 14 seasons. And uh, Ozzy had edited 200 episodes for syndication. And those got put into syndication and then Disney had them, I think, for exhibition for a while. And we're talking now, you know, a de- decade, two decades ago. And uh, and finally, uh, they have put out the first 12 seasons of The Adventures of Ozzy and Harriet, and it's streaming on various platforms. I found it on Peacock, on uh, Freevee, and uh, in Prime, I think, also has them. But you can look those up. And 
they are so delightful to watch. They were that they were in that era when when Dragnet moved over from radio to television, Ozzie and Harriet moved over from radio to television. Lucy came on in 51, Ozzie and Harriet in 52. And and uh, the boys were uh, you know, like 15 and 11, I think Ricky was, but they had been on the radio show since they were eight and 12 or somewhere in that. that uh, and so you can watch Ricky Nelson grow up. And then I started working on the show uh, in, in the 10th season and was there for 10, 11, 12, 13, and 14. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and they're just really great quality in the, in the, uh, uh, and what they've done to clean up the prints and everything. It's fabulous. They look better than they looked when we looked at them on that little 21 inch set. I don't think we got a 21 inch set till I was about 30, you know, 30 years old. Right. Was, was that shot in 16 millimeter or 35? No, it was shot in 35. 35. I thought so. it was, a, it was a, unlike, unlike other shows that, of that era in the, in the situation, family comedies, uh, Ozzy shot it like a film. We shot five days a week on that show. It was shot with a single camera, 35 millimeter, uh, and and uh, it, it was movie quality. He had some of the best, from the cinematographers to people who then later went on, a man named Bill Fraker, who shot uh, uh, Bullet and go in and paint your wagon, and you know Bill. Uh, Bill directed the original Monty Walsh with uh, oh. Lee Marvin and, and uh, you know, a fabulous guy. Uh, but he was doing sticks when I started working on Ozzy and Harriet. Stand in front of the camera, all right, roll them, sticks, clap, you know, do the clapper. And then he became an operator. And I used to sit around on the set in between and ride the camera and th think about, you know, that. You know, as it was, I wound up in front of the camera, but I had also a backup plan if if that didn't work, and that was, you know, to become something behind the scenes. Uh, you know, fabulous business, always inter you know, interesting. Yeah, great way to, for you to start for sure. Yeah. Oh yeah. And, and they could potentially clean those up and, and put out a Blu-ray. You know, if it's thirty-five well, millimeter. Well, they they've got uh, uh, there is a box set on Time Life. That's available. I think it's DVD though. It's standard def. Oh, is it? Is yeah. it standard? Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. They, if you look at the later stuff, and I can't remember if it was Free V, uh, the Prime, or the uh, uh, Peacock, uh, but on those later episodes, uh, 10, 11, 12, which I've looked at some of them, uh, you can look at look into the background and you'll find me. <laughs> And then Ozzy, of course, was the one who first threw me, uh, you know, when we come in and we're looking for Rick and Skip asked you, Skip was Wally Plumstead on the show, uh, says, uh, hey, where's Rick? And I say, who's Rick? And that's the laugh. And that was the yeah. first thing I ever said. Great. Right. Right. So it's great to, you know, look back at that. And then my wife and my daughter, uh, my, uh, our oldest daughter who will be the end of February 61. Uh, Rocky, my wife, and Kristen were on an episode of Ozzy and Harriet also. And Kristen was, I don't think she was a year old yet, but she got her work permit and uh, then later used that job to get into the Screen Actors Guild. So, wow. Very cool. She probably doesn't remember it, I'm yeah. sure. Yeah. That's, that's great. That's yeah. great. Uh, that's the that's the beauty of streaming nowadays. You know? Yeah, everything's there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, April asks, how does it feel to have been part of such an iconic show as Adam 12 and how, how it inspired thousands of people to become law enforcement officers for years to come? Well, that's always been, you know, kind of the, uh, the greatest satisfaction of having done the show. We had a great time doing the show, but the fact that we were doing something that was entertaining as well as educational and had such an influence over so many people, and, and I, I still get it uh, to this day uh, from police officers who got onto the job because they watched Adam 12 and they aspired to become 
uh, police officers. So, you know, it, it's, it's humbling. Uh, my comment to most police officers that I meet is keep your sense of humor. It's a tough job. It's so much tougher today than it was when we were doing Adam 12 or when I was growing up. Uh, the fact that it was drummed into your head as a child that you respect law enforcement, uh, you know, your parents. But the, the, it was always a double-edged sword also because if you're not good, I'm going to tell that policeman. You know, And so policemen had a bad rep, yeah. you know, from that standpoint in, in, in a sense. But uh, it, it, is, it is such a tough job today because there's such a lack of respect for what they do. You know, now 99.9% .9 of those men and women who do this job go out to do a great job to, to protect uh, the public and, and catch bad guys. You know, we've had uh, a lot of abuse that has occurred. It, it's the same problem that happens in every profession. And the weakness in the system is that they recruit, recruit from the human race. And, you know, there's... Uh, you know, who was the last perfect person to watch it walk the earth? I think Never. They called, him, yeah. they called him Jesus and look what they did to him. Yeah, right. So anyway, you know, that it's uh, the the effect that it has. Now we're, what, 56 years from doing the first episode. That it's still wow. on. Wow. It's still influencing people. I, I said to... Uh, uh, a group of recruitment people uh, not long ago, I said, you ought to hand out the box set of Adam 12 to every recruit who graduates from the academy. They should. And, and you know, and, and the fact that it's on and it's streaming on two different platforms or three right now, you can get it on demand on Freevee. There's FETV that it's on four times a day. Uh, they repeat the two episodes they show back to back each day. And it's on MeTV. So, you know, it's, it's out there and, uh, you know, the, the, the stuff that we did on Adam 12 still works. The big difference is the communications that they're able to carry with them. You've got the mic here and you've got cell phones now and, and, uh, uh, you know, the radio and the computer inside the car, all of that is different, but the human side of how you approach somebody. Yeah you know, and de-escalate whatever problem is occurring. Yeah. To handle it, you know, it, it's still very valid. Absolutely. Uh, Shelly says, the first episode was great. I love watching it still. What do you remember about walking on set when you filmed the first episode? Did you, did you feel like the show would have longevity? You know, the interesting thing about, uh, uh, I had worked with, with Jack on, uh, the pilot for drag that brought dragnet back, which was a two hour movie of the week. Mm -hmm. And I played a hotel clerk and Jack Webb was a very demanding director. And he, he uh, had a very short fuse when it came to uh, actors trying to act. <laughs> you know, he, he didn't want to see the wheels turning. He didn't want anybody to act. He just wanted yeah. to be ready. And, and, you know, his, his favorite direction to an actor was uh, don't act, just say the words, you know. And, and if you had a line and there was a period at the end of the first, uh, you know, sentence, he wanted to hear that period. And he'd say, there's a period there. I want to hear that, <laughs> you know. And so you'd go back and do it and, you know, the didn't matter how you learned it or the way you spoke or anything. He wanted that patter that you know, the Dragnet was so famous for, especially the early black and white episodes of Dragnet that were groundbreaking yeah. uh, for television fare in those days. The second incarnation of Dragnet, going back to, you know, getting into the social issues and everything, or from my taste, uh, you know, left a little to be desired. They're wonderful episodes. I, I uh, you know, Jack was doing what he thought was right to do some good, to bring, you know, some issues to the forefront and try to solve issues we still deal with, except things now have escalated uh, 
you know, into uh, fentanyl uh, epidemics of death by people selling stuff like that. Uh, but when we got ready to do the first episode, I had been on Dragnet now a number of times. And the first person that they went after, after I was cast, was uh, Bill Reynolds, who was doing the FBI with Everett Zimbalist. And Bill had worked for Jack uh, over at Warner Brothers when Jack was the head of television at Warner Brothers for, for a while. And, uh, and it had done a, 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 a series version of a movie that Jack had done called Pete Kelly's Blues. And so Bill was doing the FBI. And so Jack went to his other standby and Marty was in New York doing a play called The 90 Day Mistress with Diane Cannon. Wow. And, uh, and uh, Tony Lobianco and, you know, and, and a guy named Nicholas Costa, who we just lost recently, really good guys, Tony and, and Nick. Uh, and uh, I just met Tony last year. Did you? Yeah. He's yeah. a big guy. And, yeah. and so, so uh, he called Marty and he's, and Marty said, Jack, I'm, I'm, doing, I'm doing a play. We're going to New York. I'm going to be on Broadway. And Jack said, oh, forget that. Get a week off. Come out here and shoot this pilot. And, and so the uh, thing that happened was, you know, I, I hadn't met Marty other than I'd, I'd been in relationship with Marty only one time before. And that was on an episode of Gidget that Marty was playing the big kahuna on and I was working background. Mm -hmm. And then of course I knew Marty from Route 66, yeah. a fabulous show. He was already a star. Yeah. And so now the first morning we're getting ready to, the, to go to the, to the set, Marty and I were to be picked up in a parking lot at Universal and driven to the, to the set. And, uh, and Marty yawned and he said, oh God, I can never sleep before one of these. And I was so grateful for that yawn and the, and the fact that Marty was as this professional that he had been in this wonderful career was open enough to kind of show his vulnerability at this moment to me who hadn't slept much either the night before, you know, and that, that was basically the way Marty's and my friendship began and, and existed until, you know, Marty died. Yeah. So, yeah. Great. So the, 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 that was the first thing. The other, the other thing about the first episode was we show up, we're going to do uh, car scenes, a uh, car scene where we are chasing the bad guys that did a liquor store hold up and they go into the wash into the LA river. Uh, that wonderful scene and chase down the, down in the channel. The, and, and when we showed up, it was an overcast day and they had no shield over the, over the top of the car. So this overcast day, they set the camera up on the hood of the car with a camera bar and camera mounted and you couldn't see us. It was all reflection off of the windshield. So Jack said, oh, well, you know, the guy says, why don't we just take the windshield out? So they take the windshield out. We do a run and our hair is kind of fluttering from the wind blowing through, you know, <laughs> We're trying to make sure we don't get a fly or something. And we go, oh, that doesn't work. So we moved inside to do the liquor store uh, follow-up where the robbers, you know, where the guy describes what happened and we're going to yeah. go chase the bad guys while they built this rig. And and that was the way that the first morning started. But, uh, you know, the rest of it, you know, Marty thought, you know, I'm going to do this pilot. I'll be back. I'll be on Broadway forever and uh the 90 day mistress lasted about 90 days and uh marty was able to fulfill his commitment on that and the show sold so yeah and then it just went on forever yeah you know very cool very cool uh daniel says hi kent is there a story with ozzy nelson you could tell us that you, we've never heard before huge fan of both of you well first of all ozzy was uh one of the nicest human beings that you would ever, ever meet. And uh, he was the opposite of, of Jack. Jack was very demanding as a, as a director. 
like I said. Ozzy, Ozzy never did that. And, and we, had a, we had an episode that we were shooting about a, the house mother of the fraternity. And he had an actress hired, and we worked, and he was trying to get this performance out of her. And he, and he couldn't get it. And instead of browbeating her and giving her a line greeting and saying, say it this way, as Jack would do, Jack would take you aside. He'd stand on your mark. He'd say, now watch me. Now, when I say blah, 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 and I, you point over here. Now, do it exactly the way I should. <laughs> you know, that was Jack. Ozzy worked with this woman, worked with her. And at the end of the, at the, end of the day, he, he thanked her and everything, and she left. And the next morning, we showed up. We were on the same set with a new actor to play wow. that role and wow. and you know rather than abuse this woman or or do that and it, it was his gentleness and his humanity and and the other thing about ozzy and harry they were like family to me you know ozzy wrote in the book, book you know to my wife and me and our children you know who have become our family and i have uh, you know our, we spent our honeymoon in, in ozzy and harriet's house at the beach uh, my wife and I did. That would be coming up 63 years in uh, in July, and uh, you know, so you know, there's a wonderful book out, and and for people who are interested in the adventures of Ozzy and Harriet, it's called The Adventures of Ozzy Nelson, and uh, uh, a writer is a man named John Holmes, and I've spoken with him, and he he did just the greatest job in the world on this book and you can read the book and he talks about how certain episodes were constructed and what was behind them and you can you you go to that episode and you look at you stop reading the book and you watch the episode and you go oh man that's neat you know that's really cool his research on it and and uh i just never really got the credit that he deserved he could have created a cottage industry off of it but he was quite happy being you know, on the adventures of Ozzy and Harry, the longest running situation comedy on film, filmed live with live actors, not car, you know, not, not the Simpsons, and not, you know, that, uh, but, you know, it still exists, I think is the longest running uh, situation family comedy. And, and, uh, you know, that to, to go on that set, as I did, uh, as an 18 year old, and, and just be there and watch this the way that how great the atmosphere on a motion picture set can be uh really spoiled you <laughs> did me and and uh marty and i did our best to have the same kind of set because marty had the same kind of values about you know that that family uh that you create with a crew you know yeah. from from the the guy who's the greensman to the onset painter to you know the still photographer to the, everybody and uh you know everybody is important on a movie set and oz made sure that uh everybody knew that you know that each one of those people knew how valuable they were and uh you know so you know from from my perspective and then and then one of the greatest thing maybe i've already told this i don't know one of the fun things that that happened was uh ozzy directed two episodes of adam 12. david directed one chris nelson ricky's wife on the last season of adam 12 played my wife and and when oz came on to do Adam 12, I said to him at one point, I said, uh, uh, Mr. Nelson, should I? And he said, Kent, you can call me Ozzy. <laughs> you can call me Ozzy, you know? And, uh, you know, so that was you know, an acknowledgement yeah. that we had all grown up. Yeah, very cool. Well, it's, you, you always work better when you're comfortable with people. You know, you always get better work out of people. Yeah. And it shows, you know, it shows yeah. the longevity of all those series. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, Evan is asking, when did you find out the Adam 12 wouldn't be back for an eighth season? Well, you know, qu quite interestingly, uh, Adam 12, uh, Universal, or NBC said, we will pick Adam 12 up for season eight and nine if you withhold the syndication of the show. 
and and they didn't want to compete against themselves. A the different pattern of, of, of exhibition these days. I mean, Christ, you look at uh, uh, some of these shows are all over the place yeah. uh, on different platforms while they're still on in first run. Those days they didn't want to do it. And Universal said, no, we've got 174 episodes. We're going to cash in. And they sold it for a record number uh, as far as the cost of it was concerned and the money that Universal earned from it uh, for a half hour non-comedy. And, uh, you know, so I had, uh, we were waiting to hear whether we were going to be picked up or not. And I got a I got a, a, a telegram from a guy who was the head of talent at Universal or a vice president of talent, a man named Dave Tebbett. <laughs> and, and Dave sent me this telegram, and I opened the telegram up, and it reads, uh, "Kent, you know we we have loved our success together uh, and and everything, but I I uh, I have to inform you that we are canceling the Bob Crane show." Is the telegram sent him. Hmm. So I get on the phone and I call NBC and I ask for Dave and they, they hook me through to Dave and I get him on the phone and I, and I knew we were being canceled, you know, but I, and this was yeah. a little bit of a nudge yet. I, I call up and I said, uh, I said, Dave, uh, I got your telegram. He said, Oh yeah. yeah. Uh, she's kind of was great work. I said, you know, but I really don't give up blank about the Bob Crane show. What about Adam 12? <laughs> <laughs> and he said, Oh God, did I? Oh, I'm sorry. You know? And then we had our conversation and then they sent me, I think I've got a cover telegram that came. I've still got that telegram though. I should frame it. You should. That's it great. May on, it may be on my website somewhere. I don't remember if I've got it up there or not. Yeah. So, so how did, how did you, personally wrap up your work on Adam 12. Look, did you call Marty and you guys went out and had dinner? Did you, how did you like move on from it? Well, you know, it was strangely enough. It was kind of like graduating high school. You know, we did our seven seasons. It was great. We, you couldn't have had more fun on a show than the two of us had. Yeah. And it kind of felt like the right thing. And you know another backstory to the to the uh, to the to the cancellation and kind of where we kind of sensed something going on. We were on our way to New York to host the Macy's Thanksgiving Parade. Marty and I hosted that on NBC, and I think with Lauren Green. And and uh, so we we had just gotten gotten moved from our locked Wednesday night where we led, you know, we were like, you know, in the ratings, we'd be up to two and five and six. And for the season, we'd finish it in the top 10. And, and uh, they moved us to Tuesday night and we were going up against an emerging happy days. And the, I, I think the Jeffersons, or, or uh, Maude, I think it was. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, all of a sudden, we got really took a hit in the ratings. And I'll never forget, Jack handed me the ratings book. He said, you'll want to keep this. <laughs> you know, this work. <laughs> and, and so we're flying back, and the head of NBC is on the plane. And, it, and I go up to him, and I say, yeah, thanks a lot for moving us you know, it's Tuesday night. And he says, we will move you back rather than let this show die. And so, and so it went on and it went on and then they moved, they either moved Maude and the Jeffersons came into that slot or they moved the Jeffersons, put Maude and we started finishing third. And, and so I went to Marty and I said, uh, I think this is it, Marty. You know, we ought to take an ad thanking everybody who's on the show. So we bought an ad in the Hollywood Reporter and the Variety, the full back page, thanking every crew member who had worked with us all these years, and cast regulars and stuff. And people were coming up and saying, you know, why, why was the, you know, are you guys quitting the show? And I mean, ah, you know, we've done a lot enough. <laughs> you know? 
So yeah, yeah, you knew you could you could sense it. Yeah, yeah. there was that, and then and then you know I I didn't know the story about the the potential two year pickup until Jack's attorney, who became my attorney in a couple instances, uh, told me about it that they were ready to do it if if Universal would withhold the syndication. In the meantime, you know it's still on fifty six years later. Yeah, and, yeah. I mean, it's you know it, it it could could have still been going on today because you never run out of material. Well, you never run out of material, and and they were in Bob Senator, who was the creator of Adam Twelve. Bob Senator also with Emergency and uh, mm-hmm. a show called Chase and Sierra and a bunch of other things, and went over and worked with Diane Carroll uh, <clears throat> and Hal Cantor over at Fox on uh, uh, Diane Carroll's show. Uh, you know, Bob created a couple evergreen characters. There were so many generations of Adam 12 that we could have gone sure. through and stayed current and, and fresh. You know, so, you know, it was a it was an incredible format. Could have been like CSI, you know, or, or NCIS, you know. Could very been- easily, you know, mm-hmm. very easily. Yeah. Well, we have, you know, seven. Now, we were, by the way, we were canceled with, a, with an audience of about 25 million. Jesus, you had a twenty-five million audience today. You know they they only they only book, they only did measurements on households when we were doing Adam Twelve. Now they do it by eyeballs. Yeah. So when you're getting fifteen million households, uh, you know, and you're you're in the top ten, and uh, you know you're looking, you know, looking at a lot of people looking at you. Shows would kill to have twenty-five million now. Yeah. You know, these years later. Um, well, we have a Facebook user. Uh, they didn't allow access. We don't know who this is. They said, you were quite the athlete in your youth. Did you do a lot of your own stunts on Adam 12? Did everything I could that wasn't so dangerous. You know, I mentioned earlier the couple instances where, you know, and, and directors will tell you, uh, you know, we're going to, we're going to be able to see your face. (laughs) So can you do this? And and wherever I could, I gave that work to a stuntman. Where, wherever you know it was really called for, because stuntmen uh, are are really important to our industry to for bring sure. this illusion of reality accidentally caught to the screen. And and uh, the when I started working out background, working in background, and before I really started making stuff happen as an actor. Uh, there were a whole group of us working on John Goldfarb, Please Come Home and, and everything. And the man who became my stunt double was a good friend of mine named Craig Schutte. We had worked all together on the Presley films. And, uh, you know, we're, you know, I, I, I watch all these old films and I go, oh, there's Craig and there's Glenn Wilder and there's Dick Butler and all these guys that we were all together at one point in our careers. And then Guys went into stunt work, and you know, I, I got on the on the right side of things. I don't have that many, haven't had that many surgeries other than uh, scoping my knee and you know, and doing things that you know. So as opposed to a lot of my friends, so uh, you know, I always let I always let the uh, stunt guy do the things where it was called for. Things yeah. that I could do, I could I could do. One of the one of the other things, and I didn't get hurt on this. There's an episode of Adam Twelve that we're trying to get the street racers off off the street and, and put them on a drag strip, and and it was uh, we shot at a at a drag strip called Lions that was down by Long Beach, and Dick Clark played the owner of the drag strip that we're trying to. I remember that, yeah. And used to allowing us to put these guys there where it's going to be a safer deal. And we have a we have a scene where a uh, guy is trying to sabotage uh, all these street racers because it's going to take money out of his pocket because he's the one that's organizing them and everything. And we get a call that there's a street race going to happen at this location. And we go code three uh, to the location and we come around a corner and the flag guy 
you know, sees us and he takes off running and coming the other way towards me is Dick Clark running towards me. And I'm running towards the guy running away from me. And we worked it out. And, and when we got to that point where we're supposed to catch the guy, Dick was supposed to go to his right, and I go to my right. So we're going to our right, so we'll miss each other. Well, Dick went to his left. Oh, and, well. and I I hit Dick and just, you know, did a barrel roll over him and everything. And I remember the, the director yelling, not, not oh, Kent. He's yelling, oh, Dick. Dick, are you okay? <laughs> and I'm just getting up, brushing myself off, thinking, Jesus Christ. Yeah, you, you, you followed that? Yeah. You followed that? It was Dick Clark. <laughs> Jesus. Well, if people don't know that about you, you did race for a while, too. So you oh, yeah, I did a lot of racing. Yeah. yeah. yeah I'm I did not a lot sure of people, racing. everybody's familiar with that, but you did a lot of, did a lot of car racing. Yeah. Um, we have a question here from Peg. Uh, did you do most of your own running? I'm mostly thinking of your run across the football field, across the Coliseum. I guess wasn't that fun? Wasn't that fun? Because Dick Bass, who who I was chasing, was uh, one of the great Ram football players. Oh, and, uh, yeah. And so you know the the uh, uh, I think the last time I had been on the Coliseum turf running was at a scrimmage at the end of our spring season in 1963 at USC. But uh, uh, a, a good friend of mine, who was a roommate of Ricky's, Charlie Britt, uh, was also an Ozzie and Harriet. Charlie was a Los Angeles Ram. And, uh, you know, so, uh, you know, we had Ram events and things that we'd show up. And, and uh, you know, so to get to chase Dick Bass and, and uh, Tackle him on the turf of the Coliseum, you know, it was kind of cool. Yeah. I, yeah. I kind of liked, I loved the running, that, that running. It was, it was Very good. Cool. Very yeah. cool. Uh, Fred is asking, can you tell us about the series Jack Webb was going to do with you before he passed? Well, the, the, uh, about two days before Jack died, uh, I got a call from his secretary who had been his secretary for all of his professional career, a woman named Jean Miles. And Jean called and says, Jack wants to meet with you. And uh, so it was across the street from where Jack was living at the end of Sunset Strip at a restaurant called the Cock and Bull. And, and, uh, and I walked into the Cock and Bull and there was, you, you walk straight in the front door and off to the right was the bar and then there was a room off to the left. And Jack was in that little private dining area. And I sat down and, and Louis L'Amour also was sitting at the next table. And I met Louis L'Amour that day. And so Jack and I had this conversation and he said, listen, we're going to redo Dragnet. And uh, except this is going to be your show. And Freck is going to be your sidekick in this one. And we're going to rewrite. I've got... You know, they, they had written from radio and television about 400 episodes of Dragnet. And he said, I've got some of the best damn words that have ever been put on paper written by a man named Dick Br Richard Green. And he said, we're going to rewrite those scripts. The audience won't really know. They're all, you know, all work today. And, uh, and that's what we're going to do. And so we had our lunch, we walked outside and uh, Jack's car was being brought up by the valet Parker and, and we gave a hug and a kiss on the cheek and our, said our love yous and we'll see you when, you know, when we put this together and two days later, Jack was dead. So that was the, uh, that was the thing that we were gonna do. And it was again, one of the, uh, one of the evolutions if you wanted to take and, and we never talked about you know, we I would probably most likely be Reed, and Marty would have been Malloy, yeah. and uh, you know those were the kind of evolutions that uh, uh, you know that we could have gone through. And years later, when I put together Nashville Beat, I had created a series called Hollywood Division, where I wanted Marty and me working in Hollywood, 
And I, I put together a show called Lincoln 20, where I was the sergeant and Marty was a lieutenant. Marty said, write something where I only have to show up for half a day. <laughs> and so I, I created this show along with a man named Steve Downing, who later went on with MacGyver and with T.J. Hooker and was a LAPD deputy chief and is still a friend of mine who I talk to frequently. And, and so we created the show called Lincoln 20. And I'm the sergeant in charge of this group of officers who were in the field. I'm their supervisor. And, you know, and that was a show that we put together. And Universal didn't want to do it. So I took it to a company and sold it. And Universal contacted the company and said, we'll withhold any lawsuit till we see the finished product. And the wow. company came back to me and said, we want an identification against a lawsuit. And we couldn't give that to them. So then I, I said, well, let's just get out of it. The, because they, I, I had several heated conversations with Universal during that period trying to say, why are you doing it? You don't want to do it. You don't own, you know, you don't own Martin Milner. You don't own Kent McCord. And right. you don't own the LAPD. And this is based on fact. It's another factually based show. And, and uh, you know, so they kept saying, well, we own Adam 12. It's <laughs> fine. You own Adam 12. Good. Yeah. What could they have sued you for? Yeah. Well, you know, they were trying to do copyright infringement, I suppose. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, you know, and then the, the, the killer is indemnify us. And you can't, you can't do that. It you can't cost, guarantee that. Yeah. It would have cost a fortune. Yeah. And I had an attorney and said we could create an action against them, but it'd probably cost you, you know, uh, in attorney's fees, you know, uh, untold amounts of money. And wh whether or not it ever got settled, it would be it'd probably be 10 years before it worked through the court. So then I, I, I was meeting with some guys on a thing that we were creating for uh, uh, some training videos that would feature Marty and me. And, uh, and I had come up with the concept of Hollywood division making Marty and me out of uniform so they can't pretend that we're trading off of Adam and putting us in, in plain clothes, working out of Hollywood. And, and the guys that uh, I was meeting with loved it. And they said, can you do that in Nashville? And I said, yeah. Marty and I had been to Nashville several times. I said, yeah, we can do that in Nashville. And so we created Nashville Beat, which is you know, out there. And it was, it was a pilot. It was a movie of the week that we did for the Nashville network. And it was to serve as a pilot for a series that we were going to shoot on location in Nashville. So you can kind of look up Nashville beat. It's out there. I think it's on and how it's on. I, I have no idea <laughs> how it's on YouTube somewhere. And, so, uh, so it didn't get picked up as a series. So they just turned it into a, a TV movie. They, they, yeah, we, we, we did the TV movie. You know, we had Garth Brooks in it, and we had the, uh, you know, we, we created uh, what would have been a really fun thing to do. And we were going to do a half hour series, and we were penciled in uh, on, on the Nashville network for 104 episodes, and, you know, which would have been kind of fun. Yeah, that would have been great. Would have been great. Uh, interesting question here from Sherry. Uh, just curious, how many U.S. states have you visited? I guess it's easier to say how many you haven't visited. Yeah, I'm trying to think. Have you ever been to Alaska? I haven't been to Alaska. That's mm -hmm. that's one. And I don't think there's anything else left. Yeah, I would I think, think you've been you know, every through, through my wife's and my car trips that we've taken. You know, one year we did a wonderful thing when, when Ken Burns had done the Civil War. And I just mapped out a thing and I said, let's go. Let's go follow the Civil War. And so we we went, you know, on this route going north. We actually had AFTRA, the American Federation of Television and Radio Artists, uh, convention, which I was a, a delegate to mm -hmm. in Washington, D.C. And I said, let's let's drive to Washington and we'll do this, this Civil War tour at the same time. And so we, we covered almost every state at that point. And then from racing cars uh, in different tracks around the country, I don't think there's anything left that we haven't been to. Have you been to Maine? I did one lap of America mm -hmm. uh, one year, 
and I'm trying to remember what year that was. It was 86 or 7. And that circumnavigated the entire United States. It was it was the uh, it was the legalized rally race of the gumball rally that that you know Burt Reynolds had done in a couple movies, uh, if I remember right. You know, <laughs> so I think I've been to all of them. But you're right about Alaska. Yeah, have you been to Maine? All the way up to Maine? Oh yeah, yeah. Maine, yeah. Wow. And any favorite states that stick out? Well, you know, I, I, I've spent a lot of time in Indiana because of the 500 on my friends back there. And I've spent uh, an ordinate, probably the second most place that I've been because I'd go back for the month of May, you know, for the 500 and, and stuff. And I've been doing that for, you know, 52 or three years. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I haven't been back since the pandemic hit. And I'll, I think we're going to go back this year. Thank you. And great. when we do that, I, I generally like to drive. I love to drive. Me too. So yeah. we get in the car and head back to Indiana. It's a three-day trip. And, uh, yeah. Great. And you did a lot of personal appearances with Mark, you know, with Marty. Doing oh, yeah. We were all, yeah, we were all over, you know, with the, yeah, the great. car shows and different things, telethons. We did a, we did a, uh, a campaign for the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration on the problem drinker driver. And so we went to a lot of states and addressed a lot of, of uh, folks, uh, you know, bringing that to the uh, information to people. The, the, the fact that uh, one out of nine cars approaching you at any given time has, an, you know, somebody who's legally drunk driving it toward you, <laughs> you know, so things like that. And, uh, well, either that or either that or it's Dick Clark, not knowing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Melanie has an interesting question here about uh, an episode of Adam Twelve. I'm just going to let you read that one. Oh yeah, yeah. No, that was that was scripted. That was already scripted. Yeah. Right. I, was, I, yeah, I remember that episode. That's the first season. Yeah. Uh, another Facebook uh, member is asking if you're writing a memoir. You know, I, 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 I had a, yes, uh, I had a wonderful teacher, uh, acting teacher, and, and he was a really great guy from, you know, everything. And he said to all of us in, in this teaching environment, if you, if you, do this for no other reason than to leave it for your children. Write your life from your point of view. Because you're going to find when your parents are gone, you're going to have a million questions and there's nobody to answer. And, uh, you know, so I, I, I took his words to heart and I have a journal and I, you know, I, I write stuff and I've, I've got about 900 pages in the computer. About 150 of it is, is narrative. And the rest of it is cut and paste of things that happened in the union and the business and racing and all these other things. And, uh, and then I, I've just embarked on digitizing uh, my wife's parents left behind, I, I think it's about 10,000 slides. Whoa. And and uh, and I'm going through those and just you know and it's and it's great to run across pictures where I was taking pictures of a family event while Rocky's dad was taking pictures of the same family event so we get a different point of view and in things that when we would leave the kids with her mother and father when we go on a trip. You know, they they loved having our kids over. And so we're seeing, I'm looking at that kind of stuff. And so I've, I've, I've gotten uh, all, you know, this uh, digital converter for 35 millimeter film for negatives for all of, all of these different formats uh, to digitize this stuff. And, and in some of it, it's just in time. Some of it is, is in, and you don't think about this in film uh, so much, 
especially with videotape, which I'm not looking at right now, but, uh, you know, videotape starts to deteriorate yeah. after a number of years. And yeah. so if you don't have this stuff on a different medium, you're done. And uh, with, uh, with the slides, I'm getting into some batches where I'm going, whoa, you know, I can't color correct this. They're tar starting to turn purple. Yeah. You know, so I, I've been playing around with that. I sit and watch football. I've got my table set up. I've got these things. I've got the slide converter. I've got the trays. Thank God that uh, Rocky's mom uh, caught or, or put a number on every one of these. So you can keep track of where you're at. So you can keep track of where you are. So, you know, some of them got mixed up. There's, there's uh, a very large shoe, shoe box full of them that are stacked like four high. And I'm talking slides that are this, you know, so big. Yeah. And they're four high filling this thing. And then there's a Panama, Panasonic VCR box that is chock full up to the brim. And at least they're numbered. So you get into a thing and you say, okay, here's 1973. Now let's go through 73 and get to Christmas because that was at our house. And now I can find the, but that coupled with, uh, you know, what I, what I have put into the computer to go back and continue narrative. Uh, you know, I, I said, I said to my mother, and for those of you who are listening, you're going to run across this. I said to my mother, write down 1917, born Kansas city. That was my mother. And then on 1918, whether you, you know, or 1920, you moved to California with, with my grandma. I, you know, write that stuff down, put it, put it, you know, you know, whatever you remember. You know, now they're all gone. And I, and, and, uh, you know, and so you don't have anybody to say, wait a minute. I also found a, a thing that from my mom, uh, a little suitcase that was full of pictures. Oh, that's great. And they're incredible. I mean, this is in the 20s. And, and uh, you know, when my mom from 1917, all through this period, my grandmother came out here. There's a picture of my grandmother and my mother, Sunset Boulevard, you know, and they're standing on a thing. And then my mother, my grandmother and my mother lived in a house over by the Hollywood Bowl. And, and uh, you know, and, and so, you know, they're, they're all in it. And now that I've got these pictures, I got nobody to say, okay, not, not yet. My grandmother wrote Sunset Boulevard. Where was this on Sunset Boulevard? Yeah. You can't fact check. <laughs> yeah. You know, so. Yeah. And, also, and I think a memoir is also good for your future fans, you know, Adam 12 fans that are, that are being born now. Yeah. You know, well, you know, you, you get it together and you put this stuff down and like, like uh, my teacher had said, if for no other reason than to leave it to your kids, said enough people out, you know, if you become known, other people are going to interpret your life. You're going to read things about you that make no sense and didn't happen. Like I'm dead uh, yeah. on, on uh, YouTube, which I, yeah. how they allow that stuff to continue and be a legitimate outlet yeah. for product is, is beyond me. But, you know, you know this this uh you know the other people who will interpret it now it's from your perspective and you're remembering what happened and how this came together exactly I i've read so many stories fred about uh, uh uh what jack was talking about you know with me on that last meeting that we had i've read several things that are completely wrong i've read memoirs of my friend ricky nelson that are completely wrong and, uh, you know, and yeah. where I was inside conversations that actually happened and know what the conversation was. And, and then you read a memoir and, and it's like, uh, it, it's, it's like, we, you know, we've changed these events for dramatic purposes. Sure. Okay. Sure. The, truth, the truth wasn't enough. Yeah. Well, there's, that's, that's the old saying exists for a reason. You know, if I read it on the internet, it must be true. Yeah. Yeah. No. Um, yeah. Well, we'll look forward. Ka Kathy mentioned your book. Hey, Kathy, she mentioned your book. We just talked about that. Yeah. I guess we'll keep everybody posted on uh, on that progress whenever yeah. things are available. Uh, Melanie is writing us another short story here. Uh, that one, I think we already. Yeah, well, we just did. We already, we already did that one. Okay, yeah. that popped back up for some reason. Let's see what else we got here. Uh, 
Uh, so maybe there's gonna be Christian. No. Yeah. Uh, did you and Martin discuss the series before you acted them? The scenes well, before you acted them. Yeah, we we uh, you know one of the things that Bob Senator allowed us to do, and it kind of spoiled you as an actor also. Uh, in the days, uh, by the way, I want to go back on a thing. I, I believe that Jesus was a philosopher, a very great philosopher, and, and that he had, you know, if you followed the tenets of, of, of what he was preaching, you know, you would be a better person. But I, I don't believe in, in any organized religion. But, you know, that, uh, you know, I just want to say that instead of just no. I'm not just to wrap that one up. Yeah. But, uh, you know, the uh, Bob, allowed us we would be five six shows ahead with scripts actually in our hands so that we could read the script in advance and bob believed in you you come in to the office and we work out any problems you have with the script so that it doesn't take place on the on the set and we don't lose we don't lose shooting time arguing over you know, how, you, how you're going to do this scene. And so, you know, that's what we would do. And of course, you, you read the script, you have time to rehearse. Uh, you know, you're rehearsing on a set before you do something. Very interesting thing happened when Jack fired Bob, Senator from Adam 12. He sent down a tenant that stated that Marty and I would, would, uh, say the words in the script the way that they were written and no changes could be made and we went oh that's interesting okay so the first morning we showed up for work this is the first morning we showed up for work the 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 scene that they set up didn't match the words that we were supposed to say so we pull up and there's and nothing works. The scene doesn't work because it's not, you know, visually it's not it's not there. So they said, Well, we have to fix it. They said, Well, you gotta call Jack. And we sat on the back lot till somebody came down, and that was the last day that that thing had, that worked. <laughs> you know, no. you've got to say the words exactly, you know. Yeah. And, uh, and you yeah. guys you guys could have done those episodes in your sleep, I'm yeah. sure by then, you know, you and Marty. Yeah, uh, we have someone uh, asking about the Adam Twelve Museum. Uh, they said they heard her husband not, not periodically. You know, I, I, they did a great job with that at the Los Angeles Police Department Museum, which is in the old station in Highland Park, on on York Street in Highland Park. I was born at Avenue Forty and York Street <laughs> in Highland Park, you know, in the French Hospital, which is at the edge of Chinatown in Los Angeles. But anyway, that that police department is is uh, the museum, the LAPD museum. And they've, they've done this really wonderful exhibit, uh, you know, that they put up. And uh, I haven't been over there since since the pandemic. And, you know, and they called and they wanted to know, you know, is it okay to leave it up? And I said, yeah, I'm honored to have it up there. I'm, I'm you know, thrilled that they did it. It gives a place to put all the stuff I have and other things that they've gathered and a couple other collectors have some stuff displayed there. So, you know, it's, it's quite an honor. And as they have said, it's where the real R-E-A-L and the real R-E-E-L cops meet. <laughs> That's and great. So, yeah. Yeah. So. That's great that, you know, a lot of people get to enjoy that stuff. Yeah. Uh, no, Kent is not on any social media, just kentmccord.com. Yeah. Uh, you know, and all the updates come through this Facebook fan group. That's about the closest thing. Yeah. Or through Full Empire promotions on, on social media, the personal appearances. Uh, let's see. If someone, Shelley, I've watched all. All of season 10 through 12 of Ozzy. So she's checking that out on streaming. Uh, let's see. Got someone asking. <laughs> a three foot birthday card for you on your birthday. Wow. Wow. Well, shoot me a message, Rachel. We'll see if you can get it. That's that's a big card. <laughs> uh, Shelly, by the way, Rachel. 
situation. Yeah, very cool. Uh, yeah, the Blue Moose. Moose. She just, Shelley just watched the Blue Moose episode of on the Adventures of Ozzy and Harriet. Yeah, that was that was a fun episode to do. And and again, in the, in that particular episode, uh, you know, a man who we just lost. Uh, it's been a couple of years now. Uh, Glenn Wilder. We were all on John Goldfarb, Please Come Home, shooting on that show. And, uh, you know, that's, uh, Glenn became one of the great stunt coordinators, second unit directors. And, you know. And no so, relation to Gene Wilder? No, no hmm. relation to Gene Wilder. Hmm. Uh, Daniel's asking if you have a fan mail address. Uh, nope. No, I don't. You know, you can get in touch with me, Daniel, through the Full Empire Promotions.com site if there's anything particular. Uh, let's see if there's anything else here. Uh, got somebody fans of the classics. Okay, same thing. You can shoot shoot an interview, uh, an email through fullempirepromotions.com for that. Uh, Kent does do interviews once in a while. Uh, well, they're just commenting on that episode about his driver's license. Yeah. You know, it's it, it's interesting. I Marty was a marvelous driver. Uh, all of his work on Route 66. No, no actor was better at driving a car hitting a mark. It's like it's like in the old days with the cowboys who rode were really wonderful. You know, and you have to hit a mark. And with a horse, it's a little bit tougher than driving a car. But Marty could hit a you know come sliding into a you know, stop and hit the mark right where it was supposed to be and everything. And, and, you know, I also did a lot of driving and everything, but it became a, a real uh, question when we go out on the road, you know, people would ask, you know, how come you never drive? You know, well, you know, I'm not old enough yet or something, you know, we come yeah. just kid around with it. He was too good and at so it. Finally, and so finally it became such a thing that, uh, it, it, you know, it, they wrote a couple shows about it, you know. So, you know, that was one of them. Yeah, we have uh, someone at Clean Comedy Short asking about where they can see Pine Canyon is Burning, the movie that you did. You know, I I don't know. That was a that was another one of those really terrific missed opportunities. And uh, uh, we did Pine Canyon Burning. That was created by Bob Senator. It was starring me and and my daughter Megan. Uh, was in that she was five, and a younger a young actor who played my son Shane Sanutko, and uh, we had Andy Duggan in it, uh, who uh, was operating a brush station in the northernmost part of Los Angeles County. A real, actual situation. It's it's actually called Quail Lake, and they mm -hmm. changed it to Pine Canyon because they didn't want Quail Lake inundated with fans going up to see this this uh, brush station out there but bob came up with that uh, that premise and uh and we made the 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 show and uh it sold and it was put on uh, it was penciled in on nbc and then for whatever reason abc canceled uh the bionic woman and the bionic woman had a very very good rating still sure. for someone and NBC picked it up and they put us on the back shelf. They put, picked up Bionic one and put us in the slot where we were going to be, put us on the back shelf and said, we'll make you a mid season replacement. And in the meantime, that leadership at the network left and new leadership came in. And when that happens, yeah. <laughs> the last thing they want to do is, is, uh, it's a restart. People they just replaced. Yeah, so that that could be a lost, just a lost film, unfortunately. Oh, we ca that stayed alive. Pine Canyon stayed alive for a number of years. We cut it into a half-hour format, and uh, and tried to get it going. And uh, again, that was one of those you know, one of those things. I was so looking forward to doing that show. It was a great premise. Yeah. Yeah, this is an interesting question from Aubrey. Advice for a young couple. Have you been such a long, have you had such a long, happy marriage? I guess that's different for everybody, but. Talk. Communicate, yeah. To each other. Again, 
I'm going to give credit to my friend and teacher, and his name was Peyton Price, and, and he used to tell everybody, you know, in a marriage, you have to educate each other. You know, you either grow together or you grow apart. And each person is changing as, you know, you evolve. And so, you know, you each have to educate each other as to where you are in life and what's happening with you and and talk. That's, you know, that's been our, our, uh, our secret. You know, uh, we're in, this is 19, 2024. Rocky and I started dating in 1958. <laughs> and so, you know, in high school. And uh, we, we think it's going to work. <laughs> I would say so. <laughs> I would say it's worked. Yeah. Wow, very cool. Yeah. Uh, somebody's asking if you ever visited Atlantic City, New Jersey. Yes, yeah. I have uh, I have friends who have a house up in Vetner and up the boardwalk. And so, yeah, I've been to Atlantic City. I, uh, you know. Somebody else asking if you've ever raced in Canada. I didn't race in Canada. Uh, we were supposed to do a thing in Mossport uh, with, when I was running a VW Rabbit Bill Stein Cup Series. And uh, I didn't do it because they were going to photograph it to create a commercial. And I said... If you're going to do that with our series, then you need to talk to my commercial agent because that's what I do for a living. You know, you don't get me for nothing right. you know, to promote Volkswagen. And, uh, you know, so I didn't go when we ran up there on that on that one race. And I don't think you've ever done a convention in, in Canada that I know yeah, of. Yeah, well, I have Vancouver, oh, Toronto. Okay. okay. Uh, did one of, the, one of the, Marty and I started doing a, a with a group of guys called World of Wheels. And they they put together just a ton of shows every year. As a matter of fact, Marty and I did 22 weekends one year. Wow. And and we were we were doing we were gonna do Toronto. And I was in the middle of a negotiation. And I think it was for the original Galactica. And it got real sticky. And and Marty and I were doing Toronto and Marty was going to take Judy and Jack Webb loved taking the train. And he said, you got to take the train sometime before they destroy the whole, you know, rail system. And so I was in the middle of this negotiation and I, and I just said, let's drive down to, uh, the train station, Los Angeles Union Station, and I want to check this out. And so I went and I checked out the berth that you can get and everything. Mm -hmm. And so <laughs> we, we made reservations to take the train that was going to take us to Chicago and then from Chicago go to Toronto. And, and we got on the train and we got as far as Kansas City and we had one of these 100-year storms that closed everything, closed the whole East Coast. We got as far and we sat in Kansas City and I called Marty and I said, we're in Kansas City. We're supposed to be, you know, we were supposed to get to Chicago later that night. And this was early in the morning. And and then get it get there for the Friday night appearance. And 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 Rocky and I wound up taking a flight from Kansas City to Atlanta, Atlanta mm -hmm. to New York, New York to Toronto, and Marty oh, yeah. had to do the Friday night uh, Jesus. Uh, appearance on his own. And and I was thinking about that the other day when we've had all this bad weather. Yeah. Stuck in that. And that was my one attempt at, uh, you know, of, of looking how trains worked. Yeah. Not very well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've, I've never been a train person, yeah. you know, on either airplane or car. Yeah. Uh, uh, we interesting uh, question. Somebody's asking, "What's your favorite football team?" Well, right now, you know, USC for college and uh, Los Angeles Rams for pro football, and uh, the Chargers, who have been in Los Angeles and then moved to San Diego and are now back in in Los Angeles, are have just hired Jim Harbaugh as their coach. Hired him out of Michigan in Harbaugh. I've known for 
over 20 years, he was a partner in Panther Racing that was an IndyCar team. And I met Jim back at Indianapolis the first time. And, uh, you know, so uh, I, I was rooting for Michigan to win the national championship this year. And if it can't be USC, Michigan, and I'm happy to see that Harbaugh is going to be coming out this way. So. Cool. Uh, April is saying, would you ever consider being in another TV series or movie? You know, it would, it would be, but I'm at a point now in life where I want what Marty said, find me a show where I only have to show up for half a day <laughs> and get into, uh, yeah. you know, it, it would be, it would be fun. We talked about, uh, Farscape again with Rocco Bannon when we were in New York. And I, yeah. you know, that was one of the best damn science fiction shows that was on television. And, you know, be, uh, again, because of politics and ownership and all the, you know, the things that go on uh, in, in television and people wanting to own the rights to programming and stuff, it, it got bumped way premature uh, from what we're should have been, it should still be playing, you know, yeah. in another yeah. iteration. Well, not really, you know, I, again, you know, to me, Australia and the whole experience doesn't seem like it was 25 years ago from that very first 1999 trip down to Australia. Yeah. But, uh, you know, there's still a lot of stuff in what rock was saying. I want the, I want the, the, the same cast together. I don't want to do what they've been doing on all these reboots. You know, so Ben Browder, who's wonderful, and, and, and Claudia Black, who was terrific, and all the all the people that we worked with down there, everybody's available. Yeah, they're all still working. Yeah, and you're you know your voice is still working. You know, people just need to check out Starfield, the new video yeah. game. Yeah. yeah. Uh, let's see if we have any other questions. Here's somebody asking about Elvis. Do you have any stories of Elvis Presley? Maybe just a quick Elvis story. Well, you know, I, uh, again, I. Get, Many people have already heard this, but one of the, one of my most interesting and and uh, I don't want to say, well like maybe there, there was a lot of pride in it. We we go to uh, to Vegas for closing night of Elvis's first concert stand at the International Hotel in Vegas. First time he's come back and actually performed live and. Uh, this is the last show, and it's the drinks only show. You're not you're not at the dinner show. You're at the drinks only. So, the drinks and my wife and I don't drink. We drink a little wine, and uh, at this point in life, I, I didn't really drink anything, and uh, neither did my wife. So, what they serve you are like two splits uh, each of champagne. And it's just a little glass of champagne is what you're getting. And so we're there for the show and, and sitting, the stage is right in, in front of us. And we're at the end of a, of a table that branches out like a spoke from the stage. And Elvis comes on and he's doing his, his opening songs and everything. And he comes to the point in the show where he stops and does introductions. And, and, uh, in the audience, if I remember right, were Bill Cosby and Don Rickles, and I don't remember who else. But he gets to the, he says, and also sitting out here, ladies and gentlemen, we got a, we got a young man who's worked on some movies with me and everything, and he's now got a television show that he does called Adam Twelve. And he says, ladies and gentlemen, Kent McCord. No, <laughs> he I, surprised you. Yeah, and uh, you know, it, it was really kind of an interview. Pretty, pretty heady stuff at that point for me. Wow. And, uh, you know, we had, uh, you know, I'd, I'd come on to the set, you know, like Girl Happy or Rast About, Kiss of Cousins, all these things, you know. And he always, he, he loved the Nelsons. He always had great admiration for Rick and I always wanted to know how Ricky was doing and everything. And I'd carry back the message from Elvis to Rick, you know. You know, so it was... It was pretty good. And then Red West, who was Elvis's best friend growing up, uh, Red was a good friend of mine. He was like his bodyguard, right? He, sure. he started out, he was at Humes High School. Some guys were cornered Elvis because he 
dressed the way he did and his hair was longer and slicked back and sideburns and stood out and some guys were gonna cut Elvis's hair in the in the boys room at the at the high school and Red walked in and said what's going on here and these guys said well we're just gonna give him a little hair trim he said well you're gonna have to cut my hair first before you do his and Elvis and Red became yeah you know lifelong friends that's great and uh, you know so so Red and I became you know Red worked on Baba Black Sheep with Bobby Blake worked Red worked on a movie that I did called Woman's Story that we shot down in Memphis and uh uh you know red called me just months before he died and he said pat and i his wife pat and i are writing a book now i want to get the football game right and this is the football game that i got invited to play in on ricky's side and this was my first meeting with rick and with elvis and we played this touch football game and i just finished my freshman season in college of football and uh we had a pretty good a pretty good loaded team mm -hmm. and so red calls and he says i want to you know pat and i are writing this book and i i, I want to know did you guys have rams on that team and i said no red we didn't have any rams ricky was rooming with charlie but charlie had already gone back to georgia because the ram season was over and uh, he'd gone back to georgia we hit, but we did have and i named him players that we had and and i said and don't forget red we won <laughs> and by much, <laughs> you know, so. that just sounds like somebody you don't want to mess with. A guy named Red West. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. very cool. And it's a shame that all this stuff didn't happen now because everybody would have it on film. Yeah, yeah. it was. It, I've said this before. It it wound up maybe this park is so small when you go by it. And Rocky and I just drove by it about a month ago we were going up sunset and it's just off of sunset boulevard and i just went up there i said this is i said i i said to my wife we're driving on sunset towards our house that's it further down sunset and and i said you know i don't make a left turn here and, and our life doesn't change and and uh, so i i said i make the left turn and i said this is basically where everything changed in that park. You know, this little tiny park. And you can't believe that a football game was played there. And you can't believe that probably by the end of the day, because it was on a it was on a Sunday, and it started in the morning around nine or ten o'clock. And it went and it was winter, so it got dark earlier out here. Right. But it went until it got too dark. And by the end of the game, there may have been three, four hundred people ringing this park, if, if not more. Pat Boone was there with his wife and, and daughters, and you know, and and other people showed up that I met for the first time, you know, that that day. It's and, no wonder uh, there wasn't any media there, you know, recording it. Yeah, you know, it, you know, just kind of word of mouth in those days. You know, yeah. no cell phones. You know, someone's going to go call somebody. You had to leave and go find a payphone. Know, yeah, this is 1961. Wow. So, wow. Uh, Bobby, who has a Zoom with you tomorrow, we'll see you on the Zoom, Bobby. Yeah. What was it like for you being a reserve officer for the LA school district? Well, I I, I enjoyed it. I, I wished we had been able to accomplish more with what we set out to do. And what we set out to do with the reserve unit was to go into schools and and talk to students and try to create this bond or this trust between the, the students and these, you know, authority figures, which kids have uh, a problem recognizing, letting letting them know that they're there to help you, not to not to bust you. But you know, so many there's so many downsides to what is happening with uh, with the presence of law enforcement. I said earlier, you know, that you, you kind of get a bad rap when you're growing up. Oh, I'm gonna tell a policeman on you if you don't straighten yeah. up. And, and uh, you know, that, that uh, kind of sours the relationship from the get-go. However, you know, if they get to know people, as I did when I rode around with the LAPD and Marty rode around with the LAPD, you know, they, they, uh, they, they do the best job that they can. So we were there to try to create 
you know, a, a, a connection between them. And, and it didn't quite uh, bear out the way that, that we wanted to. We did, we had some success with it, but, uh, you know, there, there are other aspects when in, in reserve programs, you've got sworn officers who are there to do the job and they don't want to, uh, they don't want a non-paid uh, reserve to kind of do you know, wind up doing something that they should be doing and getting paid for. And right. so Makes sense. Know, I think there were, you know, there was a, a bit of resistance and I left after, uh, I left after seven years, I think it was. Uh, that's, so, that's a good run. Yeah. Uh, Sarah is asking, what would you tell someone who wants to get into acting? You know what, today, you know, in today's environment, I, I, I find that question very hard to answer because, uh, there are so many avenues now. You know, the old the old thing was is to, to get if you're if you're in college and they offer a theater course in college, you can do that. If you're not in college, there are there are teachers who are teaching. You pay to to belong to an acting class. You go, you know, to New York, you audition at the actor's studio. If they accept you, you become a member. Uh, you know, all of these things that existed in those days are still there. But then you have people who go out and they do something outrageous and they become famous. And, you know, and they're all over, they're all over YouTube and Instagram and TikTok and doing these, these kinds of things. And, and, uh, you know, they become celebrities. And, you know, the, I think the definition of celebrity is fa uh, you're famous for being famous. Yes. And, and yeah. you know, it's not, it's not particularly, a, you know, for your, uh, for the technique that you've developed in a class and how to give a given result at a given time when a director says, I want you know, to you to be controlled and contained. And then on this line, I want you to just rain down hell on this person you're talking to and to be able to do that, you know, given, given the circumstances of the, of the script. And, and so, you know, uh, you know, a, a technique is an arrangement you have with yourself to get, get, a, get a given result at a given time. That's what a technique is. And that's what most, performing is about and uh you know and so people train to do that and you know it's uh i, I saw a film the other day and it's really kind of hung with me uh about what they did and for those of you who haven't seen it yet ferrari there's a particular scene in it that's rather gruesome and and my old teacher used to say that uh you know there a, a, a wreck between a school bus and a train is dramatic, but is it drama? And the distinction that he was making is in drama, and when you, you know, a writer has a, a, the ability to put his characters in relationship to each other to come up with a result, you know, a beginning, a middle, and an end. Yeah. For Adam 12, <clears throat> we, had a, we had a lot of beginnings, and, and that's where people thought, you know, is this really going to work? Bob Senator said, trust me, it'll work, you know, because he was trying to depict the particular day in the life of two police officers in the streets of Los Angeles, where you're getting involved in multiple situations and they don't always resolve themselves. Yeah. And that was the, that was the vignetted nature of Adam 12. In most dramas, you have a beginning, a middle and an end. He got her arc. Yeah. Yeah, for and, you know, and and now they've taken it to the extreme where you have uh, something like Outlander, and where I don't know how many. I love that show, by the way. <laughs> I don't know how many episodes we're into, but the arc is still, you know, it's it's still swinging, and yeah. uh, you know, but in in uh, in Ferrari there is that wreck between the school bus and the train. This is the Penelope Cruz movie, the yeah. Adam Driver movie. Yeah, they're they're wonderful. The performers, yeah, are yeah. terrific. Yeah. And, and it's a subject that I really, 
you know, I, I, it's about cars and racing and everything else and the philosophy and, and the things that he has said that, that are said in the film uh, about the nature of those, those drivers. Uh, you know, I, I came up in an era hanging out at racetracks and watching stuff happen from 70 on. Uh, you know, when it was still, it, racing's really, the danger factors have really uh, been mitigated by safety improvements in the cars and, and all the things that that uh, that have been developed over all those years. But, uh, you know, so anyway, when it comes down to what I would tell a young performer to do, I think the only thing that I can talk about is what traditionally has been done in the past. If you want to do it bad enough, find a find a class, get involved in the class, learn a technique. Then the trick is, uh, you, you know, is is to uh, to get seen by somebody, and and usually that happens in workshops. And and uh, uh, right now, one of the things that happened in this last negotiation, and that where the strike took place before, you know, one of the striking issues was this thing of self taping mm. people are people are now doing things where they're bringing a, a friend or friends they're setting up you know you get a scene in the old days you walk into a into a room with a casting director and and they'd want you to read which you know interestingly enough uh you know, it's a three-dimensional form and not the two-dimensional form of film. But they'd want you to read. And then if they liked you, then maybe they'd bring you back and you'd read for the director or the producer. Or, you know, or you'd just go in and the director and the producer and, you know, they'd have another actor working with you instead of the, the, the uh, casting director reading across from you. That was the old traditional. Then they started doing this thing about self-taping where, where young performers are now doing, you know, they're setting up with, with, with what we have here. They're setting up lighting and they're setting up, they're bringing in a friend to read opposite and rehearsing the scene and everything. It's a far different, far different deal. And they were trying to get a handle on this thing because the whole concept of the gig society has invaded the arts. <laughs> and, and so you have, you know, this conundrum of, how do you get seen? How do you, you know, and that's where, that's where. How do you stand out from the pile? How do you stand out from the pile? You know, so you, you know, you, you go on, I don't know, you drive a car off a cliff and, you know, have your camera videoing you and you go, wow, I survived that one. Maybe I could be a stuntman. <laughs> yeah. I don't know, yeah. you know, but I just go back to the traditional thing that's worked throughout history. And that's first, you know, in, in college, uh, you know, if you're in, in school, if theater arts is where you are, you know, where your interests lie, you know, get into their acting company uh, or find somebody, you know, if you're out, you know, in, uh, in another state somewhere, you know, a little theater. That's the other thing that's happened. Little theater doesn't hardly exist anymore. No. Summer stock. Yeah. And Marty and I went out and we did a thing uh, in the, for the Kenley players that uh, we did a play called Tunnel of Love. And and uh, we spent time, you know, uh, one summer doing that. And and then Marty, when Adam 12 ended, mounted a, a, a play that he uh, it involved two actors. And he was all over the country doing that play. So I don't know that that really exists. There was the Burt Reynolds Theater down in Jupiter, Florida that you could go do. There was the such and such dinner theater in, you know, uh, in Ohio. Uh, uh, when we were doing the Kenley Players, it was uh, you'd go to Columbus, Ohio. You'd go to Toledo, Ohio, Warren, Ohio, Flint, Michigan, uh, uh, a, couple of, a couple other venues, and you'd do – two weeks of rehearsal and you go out and you play seven weeks and it was, you know, yeah. terrific. And you were also under contract with the universal. Do the studios even do contracts anymore? 
I don't think so. I'm not sure. I probably I was because of streaming. I wouldn't think yeah. they were. No. No, I was there for 15 years. Yeah. So. Yeah, completely different business now. Yeah. Um, well, we'll do a couple more here. We're going on two hours. We'll do a couple more questions and then we'll wrap. Uh, Melanie's asking uh, about your photography. You did the took the picture of Ricky Nelson that was featured on his album. Yeah, on Rudy the Fifth. Yes. Anybody wants to look up Rudy the Fifth, Ricky Nelson? I shot the cover story or the cover uh, picture on that, and uh, uh, I'm trying to see the question here. Did you? Did you? Uh, oh, oh, well, it was real. It was real simple, uh, Melanie. Uh, uh, there was a wonderful guy who existed for decades called it was the mike douglas show and the mike douglas show was in philadelphia and uh mike did came out here on the west coast and and uh he was doing shows emanating from down in san diego and ricky was going down to do uh the mike douglas show and so we drove to san diego and uh, that's when Ricky had the Stone Canyon band with Randy Meisner, who was still uh, Ricky's bass player with the Stone Canyon band, and and uh, the, uh, uh, Tom Brumley, who was a wonderful pedal steel guitar player. When Ricky really kind of pioneered the country rock sound, uh, and Tom, uh, you know, was was there. Alan Kemp was playing lead guitar and. Uh, drummer named Pat Shanahan. That was the Stone Canyon band. And so Rick was going down there and appearing on that Mike Douglas show and it was, was Linda Ronstadt and Chuck Berry and George Carlin and Rick. And so as I always did, I had my camera with me and shot a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, and, uh, and so Ricky was, had completed Rudy the Fifth and we were up at Rick's house, uh, and he had a whole bunch of pictures laid. He had a he had a, a pool pool table room, and he had a bunch of pictures laid out on the pool table. And he was saying, you know, I can't find anything. And, and I said, hey, you know, I sh the stuff I shot down at the Mike Douglas show. Let me go get it. And so I drove to my house, and and got the the uh, the stuff that I had shot, and I brought it back up. And he said. Oh, I love this one. And I said, good, you, you know, put it on there. Just give me credit. That was the only thing I said. Pretty cool. Just give me credit, which I, which I got on the album. Yeah. You know, and then you got to see your picture album. everywhere. Yeah. And then it was on the, it was on a billboard on the top of the, uh, the, the Whiskey A Go Go on Sunset Boulevard for the longest time. And, you know, stupidly from my point, I, I was driving by there and I saw that and it was, it was facing west. Sunset goes east and west. And it was facing west. And I'm driving from Beverly Hills into Sunset, and I see the thing. And I I go take pictures, and I couldn't there, get... There it is. I don't know if we can see it on the screen there. I, I don't see it. No, I don't see it. Hmm. But I, I, uh, I, I take all these pictures but i couldn't get a picture yeah that's Rudy. there it is right there yeah. yeah but i couldn't get a picture of the billboard in encapsulating the whiskey a go-go so i've got these photographs of the billboard and looking over the top from a from a point of view that i got to driving up another street you know and and then i i didn't uh i didn't get that one that I that I would have shown that it was on the whiskey a go go, but uh, yeah, that was that was the way that that worked. Yeah, very cool. Uh, well, I guess uh, yeah, mostly people just commenting now, thanking us for it. Um, would you ever consider acting with some of us YouTubers? We're seriously your biggest fans. Wow. Well, that's a, that takes in a whole. That's a question that. Brings up a whole lot of stuff. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I uh, a friend of mine asked me about doing something, and I and I I said, yeah, let's look into this and let's play around with it for a little bit. And then I thought, 
I better call the guild. You know, I was on the board of directors of Screen Actors Guild off and on for 40 years and negotiated contracts and everything. And I went, wait a minute, do we have a contract that covers this? And sure enough, they did. <laughs> and I went, whoa. And I hadn't been aware that they had created that. You know, yeah. once we merge with AFTER and you have the radio, you know, radio and television and, you know, it, it, it's all, all kinds of things come under uh, coverage now. So, you know, there's issues with uh, what scale. I, I got a call the other day. They wanted to use a piece of Adam 12 in a current series that's on. And I said, uh, I said, yeah, uh, uh, but I want to know what scene from Adam 12 you want to use. And I want to know how you're going to use it in the series. Yeah. And what scene it's going to be in. Because I don't want to be the nightlight for some unsavory thing going on, you know, <laughs> that they've got playing on television. Yeah, you don't want to tarnish Adam 12. And I said, and I said, by the way, uh, what, what's the compensation for this, this reuse? And they said, oh, we pay scale. And I said, well, I don't work for scale. So that ends that story. <laughs> you know, so. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, it looks like that's about all the questions coming in. Uh, so I guess we'll remind everybody to keep an eye out for the game Starfield. You'll see Kent's voice on there as Jacob Coe. Uh, and uh, you, know, you can follow Full Empire Promotions on social media to find out about his personal appearances. And the next uh, online event like this we're going to host, usually about every six months we do them. And uh, you know, thanks to Fred for providing this platform and Facebook. And, yeah. and, and everybody who... who tuned on here one of the things just to jump into starfield just a minute uh gaming and all this stuff i i, I go on and i look at one of the reviews and the guy says i'm 150 hours into this game <laughs> you know, that's a and commitment I've this and i've done that and, and uh, i haven't played the game but uh yeah yeah well if anybody that are watching this are gamers you know check out starfield you'll you'll hear ken on there for sure um all right. Well, I guess, you know, I never know what to expect when we do this. And it's always fun. It's always good learning new things. And, and uh, you know, thanks to, again to everybody who, who asked questions and watched us live. And I do want to remind you that if you head over to fullempirepromotions.com, uh, Kent will be doing one-on-one -on -one video chats on Zoom starting at 4 p.m. Eastern tomorrow. So if you want to chat with him personally, you can go book your session and get some autographed pictures and video greetings, whatever you'd like. Um, so, yeah, thank, thanks again, everybody, and uh, we'll catch you next time. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Hey. You're supposed to be the old expert. Uh-huh. Well, what do you know? He's human. <laughs>